Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor. Now today we're going to learn about improving battery performance by using cutting edge 3D chemistry modeling and simulation. And I will tell you more about the topic and introduce our fantastic speaker for today in just a second. But first, I want to let you know how you can make the most of the webinar experience by engaging with the presentation as it goes through. Now we will have a couple of polls throughout today's webinar. Those are for us to get to know you. It helps us to shape the content. It helps us to plan future events. So do please vote in those polls when they come up. It's really useful for us to get to know who it is who's joined us today and what we can help you to do in your research. Uh, and the other key thing, of course, is that you can ask questions. Webinars are a two-way communication street. So uh, there will be a questions box probably on the right-hand side towards the bottom, uh, depending on what platform you're using to access GoToWebinar. Uh, ask your questions at any point throughout the webinar. We're really keen for you to get them in. If they all come in at the end, then it may be a bit of a rush to pick out the best ones. So please do get your questions in as soon as they occur to you, and we will be putting them to our speaker towards the end of the presentation. We've got plenty of time today, I think, to get through as many questions as we can. So we're really keen to hear from you and for you to get the answers that you're looking for. So do please do that and engage with the polls. Now, as a little thank you for those of you who have joined us live today, you will get a certificate of attendance in the follow-up email that comes roughly 24 hours after today's event. And you will also get a link to the recording of today's presentation. Now, we don't share the slides from our presentations because we think that what's important is not just what's on screen, but also what's being said and the context that that presents to the information. So you will get a link to the recording rather than sending out the slides. You can watch that as many times as you like. Once you've got that link in your email, you can come back in, watch it whenever you need to, to try and catch up with any bits that you missed, or just remind yourself of bits that you found interesting at the time, but perhaps you were writing out a question and so you didn't get time to fully take it in. So that link will be with you ideally tomorrow. Give us a couple of days uh, just in case things don't go exactly to plan with the technology and we'll get things sorted out. So please keep those questions coming in throughout. Keep an eye out in your inbox for a link to the recording. And now I'll introduce today's speaker. Now, Dr. Lalita Subramanian is a science fellow and director at Biovia Dassault System. Uh, she has 25 years of experience delivering energy savings, uh, enabling sustainable solutions, uh, remediating product and process failures, and she's been driving innovation for her customers, which has resulted not only in patents for those, cu those customers involved, but also several different awards. She has a PhD in chemistry from IIT Madras. She's at postdoc at Cornell University and she combines her experience in computational science and data science to make sure that her customers can make faster, better, cheaper and safer batteries. So Lalitha, thank you so much for joining us. I can see that we've got you on screen. We'll hand control over to you now so you can share your presentation and then I will pop back for a poll in a little while. Meanwhile, keep your questions coming in for Lalitha and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Ben. Good afternoon, good morning, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thanks to Chemistry World for hosting this webinar. Lithium-ion batteries have become an integral part of our daily life, powering cell phones, laptops, etc. And they're now transforming the automotive sector with electric cars, buses, trucks, and on the verge of transforming electrical, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. This transition to widespread electrification has increased the demand for longer lasting, faster charging, less expensive batteries across industries ranging from automotive to high technology, consumer packaged goods, to also medical devices and variables. While the benefits of this transition are well understood, the fact remains that battery innovation hasn't kept up with society's ambitions and consumer demands. Some of the challenges that battery cell manufacturers face, number one, technology and high pace of product and technological disruption, that is changing customer specifications, changing recipes, formulations, which require to set up manufacturing and production lines to be flexible and resilient. Number two, large capital investment required to build 
your own manufacturing facility. It's exorbitant. There are typically still some problems due to weak automation level of the process. So number three is there is still a lot of human intervention and this causes yield rate problems. Then number four would be, I would say, reduce time to market and production scale up from pilot line to gigafactory. Given that most gigafactories require three to six years of ramp up to full capacity. And last but not the least, in order to be innovative, flexible, and future oriented, battery manufacturers need to adopt a suitable and sustainable way to manage their supply chain. They need precise forecasting and, and strategies to secure access to you know, critical raw materials, uh, especially those with long lead time, things like nickel, lithium, cobalt, graphite, all essential building blocks of the battery. So starting from the mining and refining the metal ores, such as nickel and cobalt that are extracted from the earth, the raw materials need to be leached into a solution, purified by precipitation, solvent extraction, or um, ion exchange. There are different met methods. This is then evaporated and crystallized into uh, metal sulfate crystals. Then the mixed metal hydrates uh, of nickel, cobalt, and other metals go through a chemical process to form the precursor cathode active materials. Now, the cathode active materials play a very, very critical role in the battery performance. Along with the right electrolytes and, of course, the anode, the cathode active materials are combined to build a cell. Assembled cells into modules and packs are then sent to the complete the device, whether it's elect electric vehicles or laptops or telephones, whatever, or aircrafts for that matter, by suitable system integration. So from a, you know, kind of a 2000 foot view, the stages involved are materials are combined to form the components of the cell. This is then assembled to cells, the cells are assembled to packs and modules and finally integrated into the system. Increasingly important and rightly so is recycling. Now battery packs can be dismantled and shredded. The shredded material are then passed into a series of mechanical and chemical filters. The lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, etc. are then collected and they start their second life by becoming precursor cathode material all over again. These steps intimately involve chemistry and chemical processes. By improving these processes, making them more streamlined, we can improve to save resources and the planet in turn. New publications pour in on a daily, weekly, monthly basis with claims of breakthrough from across the globe. But how many of these will really end up in products such as the next generation EV or powerful battery storage system that are urgently needed to become independent from fossil energy sources? Only time will tell. Lots of research is being done across the world. Now consider the battery life system life cycle. Most large organizations have a strategy around the design and engineering, manufacturing, and finally the ownership. They typically have a technology and innovation platform, battery cell design, which includes the real lab uh, testing equipment, testing facility, uh, testing protocols, characterization, um, SEM, TEM, um, uh, XPS, all of those characterizations, as well as engineering scale simulations and model-based system engineering. Next is to deal with the systems for large-scale electrode and cell manufacturing, battery pack chassis manufacturing, and going from that pilot line to a gigafactory. And thirdly, how is the battery performing in use? IoT data loop, recycling, all of this comes into picture. This is sort of the whole lifetime of the battery. Dassault systems 
3D experience platform ties all this together in one system, allowing battery and large OEMs to have the full view into the battery life cycle. 3D experience handles 3D digital twin creation from modeling and simulations. At the same time, it is a system that can bring together the virtual world with the real world lab data. 3D Experience is a platform for not only aggregating data from vendors, suppliers, from within the organization, et cetera, but it also allows for efficient collaboration. Apart from that efficient collaboration, it's a platform that allows this data to be sliced, diced, and intelligent machine learning models to be built. This is a single platform that can handle consumer feedback all the way to deep science and multi-physics, multi, of course, 3D chemistry, modeling and simulation, to data science to make informed decisions. So we will zoom into the battery cell design. We will go into the chemistry that is at the heart of this innovation. But first, let us pause for the first poll. Thank you very much. The next thing we should see on screen will be the poll, which will be your first opportunity to tell us who you are in the audience today. So we're just keen to know what your background is. Is your main educational background in engineering, science or something else? Now, being chemistry world, of course, we usually expect our audience to have at least an interest in chemistry and frequently a background in chemistry. But that doesn't mean that everybody here considers themselves a chemist. Perhaps you consider yourself an engineer, an artist, a statistician statistician who knows but we'll let's see uh, once we give enough opportunity for people to vote we'll find out really what the makeup of our audience is today and I think we can probably close it in just a few seconds I think enough of you have, have voted there let's share the results you can see if you can find yourself well just four percent of our audience are those that consider themselves as something other than a scientist or an engineer uh, 69 nice scientists uh, and 27 percent of you are engineers so at least we've got a reasonable balance and we're not only preaching to the choir here hopefully and that's a good spread and you'll all find something in this that you you get something out of. Thank you very much. Uh, Lolita, we'll hand control back and uh, we'll carry on with the presentation. So let us move on um, to the next part um, of this presentation. Okay, so the 3D experience platform covers battery engineering from subcell materials and components to the cell, to module and pack, and to finally to the system. And the system, like I said, might be a car, but it might be a, uh, a phone, might be a laptop, might be a vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft. Multi-scale modeling methods are available at every stage. The governing equations in cell modeling are nonlinear and coupled partial differential equations to be solved temporally and spatially in either 1D, 2D, partial 2D, or 3D. These use finite element solvers, which makes it possible to model complex geometries. In order to perform reliable simulations at these scales, the numerical solvers and spatial meshing have to be selected wisely. Otherwise, it'll be a very long simulation, or it may not be uh, fine enough. But if you look at the subcell modeling and simulations, there everything is really governed by the chemistry. Chemistry is the governing principle. And in this webinar, our focus is on the subcell materials and the subcell uh, component chemistry. Though we will discuss in the context of battery materials and components, which is the prominent application here, our solvers that I will be showing you are applicable in other contexts and to other materials, whether it's fuel cells, whether it's catalysts, whether it's uh, optoelectronic devices, whether it's an AR, VR uh, material, composites, et cetera. The solvers are available. So let's go look deeper into the uh, 3D chemistry uh, solvers. So before we go in there, uh, I would like to actually give a few points here. 
Battery chemistry is the most fundamental design choice for next generation EVs. The chemistry is important to choose it correctly. The development of lithium ion battery technology to date is the result of a concerted effort on basic solid state chemistry of materials for nearly half a century now. All batteries are conveniently, of course, packed electrochemical reactions. The ability of a battery to store and discharge electricity depends directly on the type and chemical reactions involved. Several ingredients required for the next generation EV batteries. First of all, you need key insights into the working. You need better understanding of how and why certain materials, why certain electrolytes work well and why certain materials do not. Then you need to improve on that. Your understanding is there. Now you want to improve to get higher charge density, higher longer lifetime, safer batteries. So the novel chemistry comes into play. Once you understand the workings, you need to try out novel chem chemistries, extend and expand the across the periodic table, really. Find lighter, safer, uh, uh, more efficient uh, chemistries. Number three would be materials properties. Now, obtaining either by measurements or by modeling and simulation, the materials properties need to be understood, whether it's transport properties, whether it's structural, mechanical, thermal properties. All of these have to be either measured experimentally or you have to simulate them. That is another point uh, in making the next generation batteries. And of course, the last but not the least again, is sustainable innovation. You want to design materials with recyclability as, crit as a critical and mandatory requirement. All this cannot be done with just lab experiments alone. They would be costly and inefficient and would in involve a lot of wasted materials. Therefore, a model first approach is uh, uh, recommended. A virtual twin approach is the way. And most of our customers and OEMs are moving forward with a healthy mix of virtual and real experiments. 3D chemistry-based virtual twin of each subcomponent of the cell involves a bottoms, bottom to top approach, retaining chemical information. Where lab experiment, where real lab experimental data is available, you can combine that with surrogate experimental data, that is simulated data, and you can run machine learning models and AI can be used on those. Now let us review briefly the assets that we have to perform a model first approach. The solvers we use are shown across length and time scales. To investigate chemical reactions, derive electronic properties, electrochemical behavior, and much more are shown here, quantum chemistry and hybrid methods. Depending on the particular question to be addressed, either of these solvers can be used to look at electronic properties. Now, moving up the time and length scale, either a classical dynamics approach or a Cosmo RS method approach can be selected. Classical dynamics approach can cover length scales going from, uh, of course, with the chemistry information, going from the bottom up from the sub nanometers angstrom level to nanometer level to 50 or even more micrometers. These are very useful for investigating the, uh, the behavior of the active material. To model reaction and growth, few other solvers are available within the Biovia's Dassault Systems uh, uh, set of tools. So for example, if you're looking at dendrite growth, you might want to consider phase field approach. Uh, there are things that you can model with the kinetics and the thermodynamics can be modeled with the other tools that are shown here, the other solvers. For data science, machine learning and analytics, et cetera, Pipeline Pilot is our workhorse. And many of you are in the audience are also using these types of solvers and um, uh, data science approaches. Different types of data can be inhaled. So it can be time series data, image data from an SEM, uh, from a scanning, uh, I mean, a TEM, from an XPS data. Images can be taken um, and chemical information can be inhaled. Uh, textual data can be inhaled, so from patents. Uh, uh, you can 
inhale uh, numeric data, of course. And the different types of machine learning algorithms and connectors are available within Pipeline Pilot. The output are rich models that can be visualized, as shown here in this little example here, but they can be, uh, you know, uh, creating reports at different levels. So depending on whether you want to see the intricate details or you want to get a summary, all of that can be uh, obtained from this one pipeline pilot uh, technology. So at one end of the spectrum, you have these powerful solvers from Biovia. Things that cover quantum mechanics, molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo simulation, thermodynamics, coarse grain modeling, as well as data sciences. And on the other side, the industry goal, improve and get me to the next best battery. There is a huge chasm between the two. These are powerful techniques in the hands of the people who know how to use it. But many of us have no time because we're doing so much work, there is also a need not only to uh, uh, get the expertise, but also to speed up, to accelerate to the next generation battery. Through three decades of contract research work for industry, we have developed key advanced technology capability assets. In a number of areas, battery is one of them. So we have battery specific validated assets. They could be models, they could be algorithms, they are data content, they are workflows. So these assets are extremely useful and they have been built using these powerful solvers. So you can look at anything from electronic to transport to mesoscale, all of that is capable through these advanced technology capabilities asset. In contract research, we then apply these advanced technologies that we have built, whether they're models or the processes that need to be simulated. What we do is use these advanced technology at assets to build very specific models for the problem at hand, simulate specific processes for the problem at hand, and calculate the associated properties and analyze the results. Following industry best practices, we first perform a series of validation runs, and then we perform the necessary production runs. These validation runs are compared against experimental data, of course, if it's available. If not, we have sources of experimental data that we can validate against. And then we perform the necessary production runs. For example, we are able to investigate electrochemical behavior from first principle simulation. No experimental data is required. We can then predict the open cell voltage as a function of state of charge. In the same way, we can create virtual twins of the subcell component and predict gas evolution and heat evolution within the cell. We deploy the experts in our team who have the knowledge and know-how to build the appropriate virtual twins to model and simulate the charge-discharge process in a cell and look at different properties as a state of charge, state of health of the cell, etc. The virtual twins and the process simulations are designed for different types of outcome to match industry's requirements. Whether a particular client wants a virtual design of experiment, or they want a custom workflow, or a root cause analysis of why something is failing or why something is not performing as expected, these type of outcomes drive the type of advanced technology capability assets we bring to bear, the kind of virtual twins we build, and the kind of production runs we run. So the end goal oriented outcome-based contract research. It's a very, very focused on the end goal for our customers. Uh, it nicely bridges the gap between the tools to get to the transformational results. That is the next generation battery. In addition to the knowledge and know-how that this bridge provides, it also allows to accelerate the time by almost 50% or more to get to the next generation product. In this case, it's a battery. 
we do this for not only batteries, we do it for composites, we do it for fuel cells, we do this kind of an exercise for so many different systems. For next generation battery with improved charge density, longer lifetime, batteries that can be charged faster, and at the same time is cheaper, lighter, smaller, we have developed several advanced scientific algorithms, specific methodologies and virtual workflows, and domain-specific scientific data has been uh, uh, generated that are very critical. This is available only via the contract research engagement. For example, in the area of designing and optimizing anodes, we have methods to simulate the transport process in the anode active material as a function of state of charge. Swelling, what happens to the anode? Is it swelling on usage? Effects of particular coatings on the anode. What happens if there's a particular coating? How does that change the behavior? We can virtually design the cathode active material at nanometer length scales as well as micrometer length scales. This is a bottoms up approach while keeping the chemical information intact. It is a first principles approach and therefore does not need any experimental data for fitting. Phase transformation on cycling of the cathode can be modeled from completely from first principles. Design of electrolytes, whether it's liquid formulations, solid state electrolyte, or a hybrid is possible by virtually screening the optimum fit for purpose formulation. The electrochemical processes can be simulated to study key behavior, gas generation, heat generation, uh, conductivity, etc. The most complex subcomponent of the battery is the SCI. For this, we have well-validated methods to simulate the formation, growth, and degradation. This is something even an experiment finds very difficult to characterize the SCI. So this is a method to get good SCI from our first principle simulations. Our customers are across the globe, different geographies from Americas to Europe to Asia and Australia, and over 25 plus years of contract research partnership with industry all across the board, whether it is transportation, automotive industry, aerospace industry, uh, high-tech industry. We have been involved in a lot of projects with these customers, to be exact, I, I would say about 15 plus engagements on battery and fuel cells alone, leaving out the other uh, types of uh, uh, projects we have done. So the, I would like to go now to the first case study. We would like to share with you is how we helped our client with virtual design of electrolytes. This was a contract research uh, project we did with a high-tech company. Among numerous products that they manufacture, they also make battery uh, cells. Their challenge was that there were numerous combinations and formulations of the solvent, salt, additives that needed to be investigated for the liquid electrolyte. Too many possibilities and each has to be tried and experimentally tested. This takes time and there is too much cost and material waste. They collaborated with us for a virtual approach to screening these numerous options. Please note, Due to the proprietary nature of all of the collaborative projects we do with industry, I will not be sharing any details of the system. You will see generic chemistry. Definitely you will see the method and the models will be generic. So here, this video shows uh, an example of what is done. Here we build 3D chemistry-based models of the anode the cathode and the electrolyte, and we grow the SCI. This shows the lithium ions flowing from the cathode to the anode as an illustrative example. To tackle the problem at hand for this industry client, we built these type of molecular models of electrolyte for a number of different combinations. I will share the methodology that is published in a paper by my colleague, Felix Hanke and coworkers. For the different formulations, we used Foresight, the molecular dynamics engine in Material Studio. Compass Force Field that we have developed was used with Foresight. 
the diffusion coefficient, transference number, and conductivity were extracted from these simulations. Then the quantitative discharge curves were then modeled. You can model it using a pseudo 2D Newman model or available in Daimola, or a full 3D Newman electrochemistry model uh, capability available in Abacus. With the method now established and validated, against experimentally measured cell voltage response curves, we can now move to the next step of virtually screening thousands of formulations. With the pipeline pilot tool, as well as uh, Cosmotherm, the Cosmo RS method, and Turbomol um, is another quantum engine, several properties can be simulated rapidly. For different ingredients in the formulation, you can calculate the chemical potential, electronic properties, viscosity, flashpoint, solubility, et cetera. And these can be determined, of course, they're all determined from first principles 3D chemistry. In a subsequent step, not shown here, contract research team used our proprietary property prediction method for the different electrolyte formulations. The virtual screening allowed to cut down the time by 45%. And in addition, a lot of material waste was avoided. By screening all of this virtually, thousands and thousands of combinations virtually, we were able to suggest a handful to be tested in the lab. So now I'll pause and hand it over to Ben for the next poll. Thank you very much. And I must say thank you as well for this sort of peek behind the curtain of information that we just normally wouldn't have access to as to how private companies and organisations that don't usually share their processes uh, are really making these big changes. And as you said, 45% is a significant uh, reduction, a significant saving there in terms of the amount of you know, time, energy, or whatever it is that you're looking at at any given time. So let's get this next poll launched and we'll find out a little bit more about our audience and how often they deploy this sort of approach. So how often do you apply 3D chemistry-based modeling and simulation for your own research? Is it very often, sometimes never, or are you here because you're considering adopting this approach in the future and you'd like to know more about the capability and and the promise that it offers. Uh, and I can tell you straight away that most of you uh, are in that boat, but we'll give plenty more people an opportunity to vote uh, so that we can really get to know you as an audience. A little reminder, especially if you missed the very beginning, uh, we're really keen to hear your questions. Uh, we, uh, quite a few have come through already, but we, we would really like to answer as many questions for you as we can uh, while we have the expertise of Dr. Luther Subramanian with us. Uh, it would seem a shame to miss out on the opportunity. So do type in your questions into GoToWebinar as soon as they occur to you and we'll have a good sort of 10, 15 minutes at the end of the presentation uh, to answer as many questions as we possibly can. And again, if you missed me saying at the beginning, if there's any part of this that you missed or you'd like to go back and watch again, we will send a link to the recorded version of this webinar uh, over the course of the next week or so. You just keep an eye out on your inbox for that. And those of you that joined us live will also get a certificate to say thank you. So uh, I think enough of you have voted now. I think we can close this down and share the results. We can see who you are. So 18%, 20% nearly of the audience are uh, applying this sort of approach uh, very, very often. Uh, a similar number, 16%, just sometimes 15% absolutely never use this approach and don't seem to have any intention to, but half of you here today uh, are considering this for the future. And I'm sure uh, at the end of this presentation, you'll think that that's exactly the right approach. So thank you very much, everybody, for getting involved with the poll. Uh, let's hand back to the leader for now. Uh, we've got a bit more presentation before we come to your questions, but do keep those questions coming in. Uh, so once again, I believe we can see your screen. We're on the virtual formulations design slide, and thank I'll you. hand it back to you. Thank you. Very good. Um, so let me move on to the second case study. Here I would like to cover, um, it, it, it's basically a niche cell developer. Uh, they are developing solid state electrolyte battery. Solid state batteries are said to be capable of delivering more energy density compared to current lithium ion technology. Increased energy density means that these batteries can be made smaller and lighter. So these all solid state batteries, ASSBs are, as they're referred uh, to, uh, are also preferred from a safety point of view. 
but there are challenges, inherent challenges in these ASSBs. Some of the solid electrolytes develop mechanical failure during usage or even during manufacturing. Our client wanted to leverage our digital twin technology and expertise to better understand what is happening during their cycling. Again, no customer proprietary information is shared, and I'm sharing a couple of generic examples. On the left is a schematic of the system to be modeled. The solid electrolyte may be something like a ceramic, like LLZO, lithium lanthanum zirconium oxide, or a polymer, or any other type of solid electrolyte. On the right, the images of Material Studio, uh, our software, uh, uh, in, uh, software front end, which has many, many solvers in it. The standard best practice is to build a model of interest, simulate the process to be investigated, and then the results need to be analyzed. Here, the video shows the building of the anode, and on top of the anode is the LLZO electrolyte. Depending on the area to be investigated, we can build different models. The zirconium uh, oxides are represented as polyhedra here for convenience. Once these structures are built, they're equilibrated and uh, using either molecular dynamics or quantum chemistry, this can be equilibrated. In this image, you can see a solid electrolyte, in this case, a polymer. And after a cascade of validated simulations, uh, the structure is analyzed under different conditions before and after cycling. The video here, um, shows a porosity scan analysis. This analysis can be run before and after subjecting the solid electrolyte to different mechanical stresses and strains. So you can see where the porosity is changing, where it is peeling off of the electrode, et cetera, uh, based on uh, your models that you've built and the processes you've simulated. By subjecting the system to a pressure, one can then investigate the response of the system to external stress conditions as shown here. So the stress strain curves can be generated. In this work, uh, we did several what if simulations. Uh, so we change the models, we change the conditions and generate uh, the output models and analyze those output models to see uh, what is happening to the system. The mechanical failure cost could then be understood better. And this insight helped us suggest certain solutions and remediation path for our customer who was dealing with this uh, challenge. Now shifting to a different case study, a technology company that produces battery was interested in optimizing their manufacturing process. You may wonder, how do you address manufacturing process with an atomistic scale simulation? There are a series of process steps in making the cell, covering aspects of mixing, coating, drying, calendaring, etc. However, in the manufacturing process, one of the most expensive steps is the activation stage. The activation process is important for battery manufacturing because of not only the high cost and time demand, but also the tight relationship that that step has with the battery degradation and the safety issues. The complex compositions and formation mechanism of the SEI, uh, shown here as an example, are the biggest challenge for the development of activation technology. This image is an example output from our simulations of the activation process. Since I cannot share the actual work again, I will share a recent publication by my colleagues Joe Abbott and Felix Hanke. It's a published paper. Using a combination of density functional theory, Monte Carlo, and molecular dynamics, the SCI activation step can be simulated. This is published uh, as recent as last uh, month or uh, uh, two months ago. And the different species formed are colored uh, different, so you can see it uh, visually inspected. Um, these are, this is the anode, this is the electrolyte, and this is the SCI formed. Um, and it's colored differently for visualization. Through simulation of the chemical process, the contract research team delivers critical insights into the manufacturing process because we can do a design of experiment, change knobs and tune 
them in such a way to get the best SEI, the most favorable thickness of the SEI, the most favorable characters of the SEI, like chemical characterizes, uh, uh, chemical components of the SEI. All of this can be done using this technology, which is published in the paper. Whether the battery is used in an electric vehicle or whether it is used in a medical device or a personal phone or a handheld vacuum, there is warranty attached to the product. Battery manufacturers are therefore keen on making sure that their warranty holds good even when there are variations in storage, external conditions such as extreme temperature or end user based usage conditions. So for example, a medical device is used by one surgeon um, uh, for eight hours and then he forgets to turn it off or turn it on or it goes into a sterilizer. That kind of usage damages the battery inside it. But all of this has to be with, within that warranty specification. So it becomes very important for a battery manufacturer to be able to uh, uh, give that warranty statement accurately. As with date, all data science projects, we had to blend data from different sources and explore if enough data of the right kind is available. Of course, I'm not showing the actual data here, but uh, uh, our customer was able to provide us the data from different sources from where they are gathering their data. Once we gather that data, we blend that data and determine if that is enough for the uh, machine learning models to be built, then we clean the data and we start building the model based on a training data set. This is then validated against um, um, uh, experimentally known uh, data. Once we know that the validation is uh, good, we then go to the prediction step. Here is a pipeline pilot protocol as an example is shown here. Two steps containing our proprietary methods have been redacted, but the rest of it is pretty much you inhale the data, do something to it, um, which is all available within pipeline pilot, and we have developed, as I said, advanced technology capabilities that are proprietary. Those uh, can be used. And then you output the uh, predictions. The data used in this project were the discharge curves on numerous cells. Cell discharge curves were selected randomly from the large set of data. Various proprietary data transformations were then applied to generate and extract features. That is a critical piece. Then machine learning models were then built with data on only the first 50 cycles. So the training data set was only the first 50 cycles. While a complete analysis was done, as an example, I'm showing only the cycle life predictions for cells with 85% capacity remaining. It could be, uh, we did it for 80%, 90%, uh, 60%, et cetera, et cetera. Predictions for only a subset of the total data are shown here. As can be seen, the predicted cycle life is very good compared to the measured data. So I have shared with you the 3D chemistry modeling and simulation capabilities. The case studies revealed a few examples of the types of challenges across multiple in industries. We showed you how we tackled these using virtual twins. To summarize, Dassault Systems contract research has the deep science solvers and the battery domain experts to tackle the tough challenges and de-risk investments from our industry customers and win early and win fast for them. The strict confidentiality and mutually beneficial IP terms and timely delivery of goal-focused milestones by contract research is the perfect formula for a winning collaboration to create next generation batteries which are lighter, faster, better, cheaper, safer, and also more sustainable. There are several battery experts at Dassault Systems. Here are a few that I work with on a daily basis to deliver multi-scale battery solutions to our industry customers. Thank you all um, uh, for uh, being a part of our team to do this. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. For further information, please visit our website or read the latest blog. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ben.
No, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. As I said earlier, really interesting to see that peek behind the curtain as to how these uh, these big changes are made in organisations that, that, although you can't say who they are, I'm sure we'll all be familiar with them if we did know. Uh, and thank you to everybody for asking your questions as well. We do have about 15 minutes now to get through some questions, so let's just fire them off and we'll see what we can do. So uh, this referred to something you were showing earlier on, and uh, Shridit has said, uh, First of all, is it possible to model the cathode electrolyte interface reaction? Now, that's something that we, I believe you did show earlier. Uh, but if so, what are the nature of the inputs that you need for the modeling efforts? Very good question. Um, as I mentioned, um, the input is fairly simple. Uh, all they need to know is what is the cathode made of? Is it NCM, LFP? What, are, what is the type of cathode? What, are, what is the electrolyte formulation? Is it solid electrolyte, liquid electrolyte? What is the formulation like mix of salt and mix of solvent, et cetera, et cetera? And that's all they need, really, uh, because this is a completely from first principles. We have force fields uh, that can handle these type of uh, systems. We have quantum chemistry. If we need to develop certain force fields that are maybe not available for a particular type of uh, chemical, but we cover quite a bit of the standard battery uh, system. So that is all the input we would need. Excellent. I hope I answered uh, so that question. <laughs> Well, they followed up. Actually, they've asked a few questions. So thank you very much, Reed. You're clearly very engaged. Um, they followed up with, how do you validate the hypothesis behind the SEI layer formation uh, in the case of new electrolytes? Do you need initial experimental data or can you do that all from modeling? That's a very good question. In order to build the SEI, we don't need initial experimental data. However, to validate the SEI, experimentally, it's also very difficult to investigate SEI because the probe of the experimental method itself, like a SEM, might actually wreck the SEI. Or if you're doing a chemical analysis after you tear open the battery, the, just the tearing open of the battery cell itself could change the SEI. So in these cases where even experiments are very difficult to do, there might be some in situ uh, experiments that can be done. And I think a, a group at Stanford is doing a phenomenal experimental uh, uh, job on that characterization of SCI. Um, so in those cases, what we do is we generate a lot of different models of the SCI. And then we compare what can be compared like, okay, you know, it has lithium fluoride rich or it's lithium carbonate rich. Uh, that analysis can be done after the fact that when you do the experiments, you can actually characterize those. And then we say, OK, our model is showing, uh, you know, a virtual twin number one is matching best with your experiments or virtual twin number five is matching best with your experiments. That is how we validate in the case of things where you can't even do an experiment very successfully or easily. We've, we've had a couple of questions here about, about the nature of contract research itself. So uh, let's sort of slightly veer away from the science and talk more about the interpersonal stuff. Uh, so we had a question from Vai Kian who said, oh, typically, what's the duration of a contract research? How long do these projects last? That is quite uh, all, o all over the board. So it depends on really how difficult the problem is. And in the cases of battery, I would say, most of our projects range from uh, six months to about even 18 months um, because, you know, you're really looking at the investigation of that particular uh, challenge. And experimentally, it would have taken three to five years or even 10 years to do it. So we try to hasten it and accelerate it. But these challenges are uh, not simple. And therefore, I would say anywhere from six to 18 months. I see. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned a mutually beneficial uh, IP approach. Uh -huh. uh, one of the questions we've got is who does own the resulting IP that comes from that sort of interaction? Very good question. So all of the IP from the work, the results belong to our customer. The only IP we maintain is our software and what we develop in our software. So basically every research result is our customer's IP. Right, so I see, but if you've had to develop new models in order to answer their questions, you retain the IP for the models, no, they actually retain not. the IP for the answers. Oh, oh really? No, they, oh, okay. 
they get the IP on the models as well. We only retain uh, what is in our head in terms of methodologies, <laughs> algorithms, et cetera. And we've got already the advanced technology capability assets that we've developed. So those IPs are ours. Excellent. Well, that, that does sound mutually beneficial. So if if there are people in the audience today, and as we saw, there are uh, you know, over half of them were, uh, were thinking about using this sort of approach in the future. If they wanted uh, a project that would interact with you, what would be the next step? How would they take this forward? Email me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my email is right there. Um, or contact uh, Dassault Systems uh, representative that you are working with, uh, or you definitely can feel free to email me direct and I'll definitely respond either to questions on how to engage or any technical scientific questions. I'd be very happy That's to extremely engage. Extremely kind of you, nice to give you your time like that. Uh, okay, let's let's get more back towards modeling and science and so on. As Susan Graef says, uh, for, do you recommend a specific AI model to use or is that sort of case specific? Um, when you say specific AI model, I'm guessing she means AI methodology, um, perhaps. Uh, so I, that really depends on the problem, the, the data, the problem, the features that we, uh, or the characteristics that we are using. And we try quite a few different methodologies and uh, determine, and we have another proprietary method. One of my uh, colleagues in my team has developed, uh, Quan Skinner, he's a fantastic uh, data science expert. Uh, uh, he has de uh, devised a, man a methodology to arrive at the best uh, uh, algorithm for a particular problem. Let's see. Um, there are so many questions coming in now. Thank you so much to everybody. We will keep a record of all of these and send them on to Dassault. So if, if they have specific questions that, that you need help with, then hopefully somebody will be able to get back to you at a later date. Um, let's have a look. This one's from Hugh, who says, uh, there are many different types of data. How do you know what data to use or which data, correctly data being a plural, uh, and which will confound your model? Very good question. So we work in phases. So we basically, uh, the first phase is to pick the data. So we do a design phase with our customer and we actually uh, look at their data and determine what is the best data. We do a little bit of exercise on that design stage as well. Uh, we call it design stage, but it's really actually a modeling and sim stage in it, in it by itself. It's just not the full blown um, uh, modeling and simulation or data science activity. So we actually investigate the kind of data that is available, uh, the kind of data that would work for the challenge uh, that needs to be uh, addressed. So we go in phases and the first design phase or design stage, that's when we work with our customer to determine if that data is good, bad, or enough. <laughs> Um, okay, let's have a look. Richard has said uh, your solid phases that you showed earlier in the presentation were shown as perfect crystals. Can you handle amorphous fractal solids? The, he gives the example of decorated diatomaceous earth. Yes, very good question. Good, good point. Good question. Yes, these are ideal systems I've shown, but in the projects itself, uh, we do can handle amorphous systems. We have a very nice amorphous builder within Material Studio that allows you to build and amorphize uh, uh, different types of materials. Even you can build a glassy material, you can simulate an annealed uh, darn model to uh, come up with random structures. So we can build, we can build grain boundaries, we can build step defects we build a lot of defects into the system itself because of course nothing is ideal in the real world yep of course um so let's stick, sticking with crystal structures uh Alaganambi says in the case of solid polymer electrolytes what's the influence or consequences of crystallinity of polymer on dendrite formation mm. very good question uh yeah. i would say that it it not only depends on that uh, morphology of the polymer, but it also depends on the electronic nature, what type of polymer it is, whether it's a 
oxide rich, sulfide rich, some other uh, type of polymer, PPO, PP, PPS, PP something else. Um, it, it could change quite a, dramatically. So I would say it's got both uh, a morphological uh, structural influence as well as uh, ionic and electronic uh, uh, features of that polymer itself that ma uh, makes a difference. Both of those go hand in hand. So it's not just the morphology. Thank you. It, uh, quite a tricky question there. Thank you for sending it in, though. Um, well, how long have we got? We've got about four minutes left. Let's see if we can uh, run through a few more questions. Uh, had this one uh, from Srijit again, who said, uh, when you are predicting cell life based on a training set, mm. uh, is it only applicable for a particular set of chemistry? So the anode, cathode and electrolyte that we use for training. If so if you change one component, can you still predict the cell life? Very, very smart question. Yes. Um, uh, so I'm going to take this offline. Um, if uh, if I can get the email of the person who asked that question, I would like to discuss this offline because this is going into proprietary te te territory that I would and like to discuss. cover it four minutes as well, I imagine. <laughs> uh, it could be, but it's on the proprietary <laughs> side of things that uh, we need to take this offline. I see. Well, Shrijit, thank you. You've asked many great questions, so uh, I hope we've we've done you justice, even if one of them is edging a little bit towards the uh, the patented zone. Um, so, uh, with a few minutes left to go, let's uh, let's do. Um, many new industries need predictions, but they don't have uh, details of internals for detailed modeling for lack of real world data. How is that going to be resolved through um, through this sort of modeling? So if the question is about data science, uh, data science does require data. So uh, we do have access to some amount of data if it is the same, uh, if that is applicable then to this problem and to this challenge, it can be used. But typically our customers bring the data to us because they have lots and lots of IoT data. They collect during usage, they collect during cell testing, et cetera. So, there's no dearth. In fact, there's big data there. Excellent. Uh, that question was from Sridhar. Thank you for your question. Uh, now, we've had a couple of questions that I'm going to wrap together that I think are very nice ones to, to see us out with. Um, Fernando says, what are the next frontiers in the field of molecular simulations in batteries? Uh, and uh, who else was it? There was also uh, Stridhar again. What is the future, physics-based or data-driven modeling? Uh, can you repeat that question again? They want to know what's uh, so a physics-based model. Uh... So what's the future for modeling? Should it be physics-based or data-driven? And what are the next frontiers in molecular simulations in batteries? <laughs> All right. Um, uh... Let me take the first one first. Uh, so physics-based uh, um, modeling can be done as well. And we have our sister brand, Simulia, uh, that we work very closely with to do these physics-based modeling, um, solving 3D Newman um, equation type uh, modeling, thermomechanical equations that are modeled. So we work very closely with them, but it kind of like, I would say it's a supplement and a complement. It goes hand in hand. So some of our output is fed into their models uh, when mm -hmm. they don't have experimental data. They need experimental data to model. Therefore, we act as the surrogate uh, model uh, provider, surrogate property providers for the physics-based models. It can also be done for the data, uh, you know, data science. So you can do the modeling and simulation and get surrogate data, which I did mention earlier. Uh, well, that just leaves just one minute to go. So I think sadly we've run out of time, but thank you everybody for all of your excellent questions. Uh, you've kept Lolita on her toes uh, oh, yes. through the last 15 minutes. <laughs> so uh, so thank you. That clearly is a good sign that her presentation hit the mark, inspired lots of good questions. And thank you to, to you, uh, Lolita, for, for spending the last uh, the hour with us, uh, giving us a peek behind the curtain and a really good insight into where this technology is now and where it can take us and the sorts of efficiency savings that we can make in terms of battery technology by understanding better and by modeling better what's going on inside those cells. So thank you so much for joining and us. Thank you. <laughs>
Oh, we're, we're delighted to have you here. And thank you to, to Dassault System, really. So they were the people who put us in touch with you. They were the people who, uh, who said, we think this is something that will be very interesting to your community. Clearly, they've been proven right. And they're a partner that we work with quite regularly, who are always identifying things that our community need to know about, will greatly benefit from. So we're delighted to have them as a partner for Chemistry World. So thank you to them as well. Thank you to Chris and Francis from my team, who have been keeping things running smoothly, launching the polls, answering your questions where possible, and that sort of thing. Always good to have them with us as well. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor. Keep an eye out in your inboxes for a link to the recorded version of this webinar and for those of you who joined us live a link to your certificate as well and that's it for today's webinar we will be back with another chemistry world webinar very soon and we hope you'll be able to join us for that thanks again